most powerful warship on Earth is loose in the Atlantic. The German battleship Bismarck wields the firepower to crush any ship in the Allied fleet. The British must call on courageous airmen flying outdated swordfish biplanes to help hunt down Hitler's superweapon and pound her into oblivion. Now, through remarkable computer animation, it's a dogfight on the sea. The incredible story of the life and death of Germany's greatest warship and the air power that turned the tide. Experience the battle, dissect the tactics, relive the hunt for the Bismarck. May 24th, 1941, dawn. Two lethal German warships race through the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. The heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen leads the formation. Behind her looms a fortress of guns and steel, battleship Bismarck. Bismarck, the largest warship afloat, is on her maiden voyage, a top secret mission code name, Exercise Rhine. The Germans' plan? Steal into the Atlantic undetected and attack Allied convoys. Convoys are absolutely vital. These are Britain's lifeline. Without them, Britain will fall. If a ship like the Bismarck finds a convoy, none of the escorts that the convoy has are big enough to take her on. Ernst Lindemann is captain of the great battleship. But the mission is so important a battle-tested veteran, Fleet Admiral Gunter Lugens, commands from the bridge. Heinrich Kunt is a 24-year-old machinist's mate. Indirect war auf der Bismarck dann eine. On Bismarck, we eagerly anticipated the mission. We knew Bismarck was the most powerful battleship afloat. But we also knew the British outnumbered us and wondered as we put to sea what will happen. Unknown to the Germans, 30 miles to the southeast, two British ships steer an intercept course at full speed. The battleship Prince of Wales and the pride of the British Navy, HMS Hood. Admiral Lancelot Holland commands the operation from Hood. Ted Briggs is an 18-year-old signalman. Hood's reputation was, was fantastic. She was the be-all and end-all, as far as we were concerned. Without a doubt, she was the most famous warship of any kind, of any country. Admiral Holland's battle plan has already suffered a setback. He had hoped to beat the Germans to the mouth of the Denmark Strait and cross their T, positioned to fire all his guns in full broadside. But during the night, the British lose contact with the enemy. The morning finds them out of position. The Germans now have the upper hand. The Germans find that they have achieved completely by accident the tactical advantage that sailors since Nelson have been looking for. They're effectively crossing the T of the enemy. This means that Bismarck can bring all her guns to bear whilst the British are steaming in column and only their forward guns can bear initially. But the British steam in unafraid. Hood is the embodiment of British sea power. At 5.52 a.m., 14 miles from the Germans, Hood shoots first. The shells land off Prince Eugen's starboard bow. A salvo from Prince of Wales quickly follows. The British shells miss their mark. British armor-piercing shells plunge into the sea. Huge columns of water erupt around the German ships, but Admiral Lugens holds his fire. And so viel ich mich erinnern kann, wurden haben wir etwas früher gewechselt. 
We went to action stations and were waiting for orders to fire. The anticipation was unbearable. We knew we were under attack. But why weren't we shooting back? Lutyen's job, as he saw it, was not to fight warships. His job was to destroy commerce. If he was badly damaged, he'd have to return to port, his mission over. The British blast away. Shells scream over the German ships at almost 2,000 miles per hour. But Luchens still refuses to return fire. Finally, a frustrated Captain Lindemann steps in and says, I will not have my ship shot out from under my ass. Bismarck opens fire. Lethal one-ton shells tear toward Hood. Germany has unleashed the fury of the most powerful warship on Earth. February 14, 1939, Hamburg, Germany. It's a glorious day for the Third Reich, christening Hitler's mightiest triumph, the battleship Bismarck. German newsreels proudly claim the great ship weighs 35,000 tons, the legal limit set by international naval treaties after World War I. The truth is a closely guarded secret. Bismarck weighs an astonishing 50,000 tons. When we saw Bismarck in Hamburg, we were tremendously surprised at its size. Some compartments on Bismarck were three stories high. I'd never seen a ship so impressive. She's nearly a sixth of a mile long. Her sides are armored with 13 inches of steel, and her 118-foot beam creates a uniquely stable platform for her eight 15-inch guns. Not only was I extremely proud to get back ships of that size, it was the biggest and was the extreme sign of power. On May 18, 1941, Bismarck secretly embarks on Exercise Rhine. But three days later, a Royal Air Force Spitfire photographs Bismarck near Bergen, Norway. The Royal Navy quickly dispatches battleship Prince of Wales and Britain's largest warship, HMS Hood. When commissioned in 1920, Hood was the longest and fastest warship in the world. She's 860 feet long and weighs 48,000 tons. Both Hood and Bismarck are armed with eight 15-inch guns that can hurl 1,700-pound shells over 15 miles. But Bismarck's newer guns can fire three shells a minute to Hood's two. The critical difference is armor. Bismarck, a battleship, is heavily armored. Hood, a battle cruiser built for speed, is not. They were designed to hunt down and sink enemy cruisers. They were never designed to stand up in the line of battle against battleships. The armor on Hood's deck is no more than three inches thick. Shells dropping from a steep angle, called plunging fire, can easily punch through and explode inside. She was always intended to, to go in for a, a, a full refit to have the deck armor fortified. But unfortunately, war was declared and she couldn't be spared. Now, on May 24th, 1941, Hood and Bismarck opened fire. When the big guns fired, the entire ship staggered. It felt like it was bending and was pushed sideways in the water. It was amazing. The guns were so incredibly powerful. 
Hood and Prince of Wales are here. Bismarck and Prince Eugen are here, 13 miles away. Knowing the threat of plunging fire to Hood, the British race in, trying to get close enough to force the German gunners to fire at a flat trajectory. The shells will hopefully strike Hood's 12-inch hull armor rather than the thin deck. Bismarck's first salvo barely misses, exploding just off Hood's starboard bow. Bismarck fires again. The German gunners zero in with deadly efficiency. The pride of the Royal Navy is squarely in their sights. May 24th, 1941. The most powerful warship afloat, the German battleship Bismarck and heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen, exchange fire with the pride of the British Navy, HMS Hood and Prince of Wales. Bismarck and Prince Eugen are here, northwest of Hood and Prince of Wales. The Germans have the advantage. They're able to fire a full broadside while the British are only able to use their forward guns. Just four minutes into the battle, the Germans draw first blood. A shell rips through Hood's ammunition locker, exploding four-inch anti-aircraft shells. A hurricane of shrapnel cuts down the men on the deck. From the compass platform, the highest point of Hood's Bridge, Ted Briggs witnesses the carnage. That hit penetrated at the base of the mainmast, and it caused a fire around the four-inch ready-use lockers, which was creating one hell of a mess. And killed quite a lot of people. Another shell strikes Hood close to her main tower. The situation is desperate. At eight miles, Admiral Holland orders a hard turn to port to bring her full broadside to bear. At this point, Vice Admiral Holland probably felt that he had closed the range sufficiently enough to be out from under the da danger of plunging fire. But Holland has miscalculated. Bismarck fires her eight 15-inch guns. Her rangefinders locked on hood. Ja, dann ist nur de, dann wir haben wir ja die Abschüsse gemerkt. The enormous blasts rocked the ship back into the water due to the recoil. We knew if the shells hit their target, there would be tremendous damage. seconds in flight, a single 1,700-pound armor-piercing shell plunges through Hood, dead center. The armor-piercing shell penetrates deep into the bowels of the ship. The powder in a main magazine ignites. British crewmen on Prince of Wales watch in muted horror as a geyser of flame spews from Hood's ruptured deck. This massive amount of powder in that magazine did something we call deflagration. It's like a giant Roman candle burning in an enclosed space. Then, a huge explosion buckles the hull. Twisting and shearing the mighty ship in half.
the bow lifts vertically into the air as her midsection sinks. She'd gone about 30 degrees at 30, 40 degrees, I suppose. We realized that she just wasn't coming back. There was no order given to abandon ship. It, it wasn't necessary. Ted Briggs and the men on the compass platform struggled to escape. The flag lieutenant was just in front of me. Uh, my squadron navigating officer, Commander Warren, um, stood to one side to let me go through. He just went like that. Can't forget that. Across the water, the Germans look on at their stricken adversary. The ship broke into pieces. We were sure an explosion of that kind must have killed everybody. As Hood slides beneath the waves, her forward turret fires a final defiant salvo before slipping into darkness. I managed to get out of the, of the starboard door of the compass platform, down the uh, ladder to the Admiral's Bridge, which was directly underneath. And it was uh, about halfway down that ladder when I became level with the water. And it was dragging me down. Briggs is pulled deeper and deeper by the sinking ship. I honestly thought I'd had it. It was then that I suddenly seemed to shoot to the surface. I came up and looked around, and there was the ship. About 50 yards away, like that. I panicked, turned and tried to swim away as fast as I could. When I looked around again, she'd gone. There was a fire on the water where she'd been. There were only three of us that came to the surface. Of the other, 1,418 were lost. When we heard that the hood was sinking, we were celebrating what we accomplished. But then we were horrified at the devastation that was happening. We recognized that on hood, there were many sailors who must have suffered a horrible death from the explosion. Und somit also einen schrecklichen Tod durch die Explosion erlitten haben mussten. In less than 10 minutes, the massive guns of Hitler's superweapon have obliterated the pride of the British Navy. It's a stunning victory. Bismarck now turns her attention to Prince of Wales. With the loss of the flagship, the British were suddenly in a terribly weak tactical position. HMS Prince of Wales is alone. She's a brand new ship, she's inexperienced, and she's also experiencing significant mechanical problems with her machinery. Prince of Wales wields plenty of firepower, 10 14-inch guns, but eight of her guns are housed in complex new quadruple turrets that are untested and malfunctioning. Bismarck and Prince Eugen are here. The Prince of Wales is here, just eight miles away. Prince of Wales Captain John Leach orders a hard turn to starboard to avoid Hood's wreckage. Bismarck and Prince Eugen train her guns on the lone British ship. It was so very extremely easy for the Germans to offer to switch targets a tiny, minute alteration to their stereoscopic rangefinders brought their fire to bear on Prince of Wales almost immediately. The German strategy is simple. Put shells on the target. Bismarck and Prince Eugen rapid fire their main and secondary armament. The results are devastating. first hit struck the compass platform where Leach himself was standing. He killed everyone there except for himself and two others. The second hit struck a director control tower just to the rear of the compass platform. 
the next series of hits would strike the ship uh, on her aircraft crane, her funnel, uh, in the boat deck, and three below the waterline. But the withering German assault is too much for the battered battleship. She suffers seven devastating hits. 14 men are dead, and her guns are jammed. There was really no way that she was in a position to take on two German fleet units that were trained and worked up. After firing 23 salvos, Prince of Wales makes smoke and retreats to the southeast. Admiral Luchens, aboard Bismarck, chooses not to follow. She's suffered three damaging hits from Prince of Wales. 2,000 tons of seawater flood her forward compartments, and her fuel tanks are ruptured. She's hemorrhaging precious oil. Admiral Luchens must find a port and put in for repairs. At 6.14 p.m. on May 24, 1941, Bismarck breaks away from Prinz Eugen and steams for sanctuary in Nazi-occupied France. Bismarck vanished in the direction of west, and that was the last time we saw the Bismarck. For the Royal Navy, the loss of Hood is devastating, but the tragedy only strengthens their resolve. With unrelenting determination, they deploy every weapon in their arsenal, including a fleet of antiquated torpedo bombers, to avenge the loss of Hood and sink the Bismarck. May 24, 1941. Hitler's newest superweapon, battleship Bismarck, has obliterated the symbol of British sea power, HMS Hood and crippled the battleship Prince of Wales. The tragic news spreads rapidly. The reaction in Britain to the loss of the hood was a, a mixture of, of fury and a desire for revenge, an absolute shock. This was the pride of the Royal Navy. This was the unsinkable ship. This was the mighty hood. The effect on the morale in Great Britain was absolutely catastrophic. The British respond quickly and decisively. Prime Minister Winston Churchill vows, Bismarck must be sunk at all costs. We all wanted to revenge the hood. There's no doubt about it. Every ship in the Navy, the smallest ship, the biggest ship in the Navy, wanted to revenge the hood. And that's what we sent out to do. Within hours after Hood's sinking, Nearly every warship in the North Atlantic is sent to reinforce Fleet Admiral John Tubby's command. Bismarck is now 2,000 miles from France. The wounded Prince of Wales shadows Bismarck with the cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk. Tubby himself commands the operation from the battleship King George V. His battle group is 300 miles east of Bismarck. A detachment known as Force H steams in from the south. Tavi, hours behind Bismarck, determines his best weapon for a quick counterattack is an airstrike. May 26th, 11.30 p.m. This far north, it's still light as the fleet air arm launches a flight of swordfish torpedo bombers from the aircraft carrier Victorious. Cruising at 85 miles per hour, the swordfish use a primitive onboard radar system to navigate toward Bismarck. Built by the Ferry Aviation Company in 1934, the swordfish, affectionately known as the string bag, is a lightweight biplane with a metal frame covered in fabric. The aircraft carries a crew of three, a pilot, observer, and rear gunner. The dual wing design gives it incredible lift, allowing for very short takeoffs from the decks of small carriers. People viewed the swordfish as being outdated or even obsolete at the start of the Second World War. Outdated, perhaps, yes. Outclassed, no. It was the most 
maneuverable even down to very slow speeds of about 60 knots, you are still in control. The plane's primary armament is one Mark 12 18-inch torpedo, packing a powerful 388-pound charge of TNT. A year earlier, Swordfish sank five battleships during the attack on Toronto in Italy, helping to demonstrate the new thinking in naval warfare. Airplanes can dominate battleships. Now, a flight of eight swordfish speed toward Bismarck. They break into three attack groups. Flying in single file, they dive steeply down to 200 feet, banking into the target and fanning out parallel to one another to split anti-aircraft fire. As the planes approach, the steel fortress erupts, opening up with her 52 anti-aircraft guns. An entire ship's worth of armament barrage was being focused on just this poor selection of very antiquated biplanes scurrying in towards the ship in the hope that they could get their one torpedo launched and score some kind of effective blow. The German gunners use a clever tactic. They fire Bismarck's main armament into the sea, creating massive walls of water in front of the tiny biplanes. The courageous swordfish pilots press their attack, dropping to just 60 feet above the waves. They're flying so low and slow, Bismarck is unable to train her guns. The swordfish pilots punch the torpedo release button on their throttles. Mark 12 torpedoes accelerate to 40 knots and close on the battleship. Dass uns britische Torpedoflugzeuge angreifen. British torpedo planes started to attack us. Our captain ordered many quick, violent turns to dodge the torpedoes. Bismarck evades the first wave. Then, a swordfish piloted by Lieutenant Percy Jick with air gunner Les Sayer and navigator VK Norfolk sweeps in and fires. A massive column of water soars 150 feet in the air amidships on Bismarck. One torpedo exploded against the armor belt. The massive concussion threw us off our feet. And the jolt triggered the shutoff valves in the turbines. We had to quickly restart the engines. During the attack, the boatswain's mate, Chief Petty Officer Kurt Kirkberg, was thrown into the airplane catapult and died. Bismarck has suffered its first fatality. But the torpedo has struck the thick armor belt and done little structural damage. Having dropped their single torpedoes, the swordfish pull into cloud cover and return to their carrier. The aviators have sent a message. As long as Bismarck is shadowed, Tuvi will keep sending waves of aerial assaults. For Admiral Luchens aboard Bismarck, his next move is clear. He must shake the British ships from his tail. Luchens knows the British are steering in a zigzag pattern to avoid possible U-boat attack. When they're at their furthest point, Bismarck turns hard to starboard, looping back over her own wake. The British lose radar contact and steam right past the German ship. For the next few hours, British radar operators work frantically to re-establish contact, but to no avail. At 5 a.m., 24 hours after the sinking of Hood, the cruisers send an ominous message to Tuffy, have lost contact with enemy. And so 
Luchins and Bismarck slip away, Tubby moves in the opposite direction, and it seems that in this game of chess that these two admirals are playing in the high seas, Luchins is now winning. The biggest battleship on Earth is now steaming for the safety of Nazi-occupied France undetected, hiding somewhere in the vast storm-tossed seas of the North Atlantic. May 26th, 1941. For 30 hours, ships and planes of the British home fleet have scoured the North Atlantic for some sign of battleship Bismarck. But Bismarck has simply disappeared. We were very despondent. Everybody, everybody, and I mean everybody, from the lowest boy to the, the highest officer on board was uh, in a terrible state because we had lost to Bismarck. Aboard Bismarck, the crew hopes by morning to be within 200 miles of France, waters controlled by the German Luftwaffe. Desperate to re-establish contact, Fleet Admiral Tuvey dispatches Catalina flying boats, or PBYs. Their American aircraft lend lease to Britain to support the war effort. Their incredible 2,500-mile range makes them ideal for long-distance searches. They comb the seas for hours. Then, at 10.30 a.m., 36 hours after losing her, a PBY crew spots a dull black shape moving across the water. Bismarck has been found. Bismarck has been spotted here, 700 miles from the coast of France. Admiral Tovey's battle group is here, 130 miles directly north. Tovey must slow Bismarck down to get in range to strike. In perfect position for this mission is a task group steaming in from the south, known as Force H, which includes the aircraft carrier Ark Royal. May 26, 1941, 7 p.m. Eight hours after finding Bismarck, 15 swordfish torpedo bombers from Ark Royal speed toward the German battleship. Lieutenant John Jock Moffat pilots one of the ferry swordfish. We were told to go in there and do our best and get as many torpedoes into her as we could possibly do. Moffat and his crew break through the clouds and descend on their target. My first impression of the Bismarck, when I saw it on my starboard side about two miles away, it was really awesome. Moffat's flight of three swordfish close in at 115 miles per hour. 6,000 feet, all of a sudden, all hell was let loose. Bismarck's anti-aircraft gunners desperately filled the sky with flak. I had no, no doubts about what was going to happen, and I was scared stiff. I thought the only way I, I could survive was to get as low as possible. And the nearer I got to the ship, I was hoping that they uh, wouldn't be able to get their guns down low enough. Moffat closes to within 2,000 yards and prepares to launch. There was a voice suddenly says to me, not yet, Jock. And this was my observer. And I thought, what? What's happening? And, and he kept saying it, not yet, not yet. And then out of the corner of my eye, I, I happened to turn slightly to, to the right. And there was a friend of mine hanging outside this aircraft with his bottom in the air, but I don't know how he did it, in fact. But he was leaning right outside the aircraft with his head right underneath the fuselage. And he was shouting, not yet, not yet. And then it dawned on me, why? In these high seas, Moffat's observer knows that if the torpedo hits the top of a wave, the impact could veer it off course. 
With only one torpedo, he has to make the shot count. He hangs upside down, judging the wave height, waiting for the right moment. If you could release the torpedo that went into a trough of the wave, then you had a chance. And that's when he said to me, let her go. And when I said, let her go, he said, Jock, we've got a runner. Bismarck makes a hard turn to port to avoid the torpedo. It's a fatal miscalculation. 51 seconds after Moffat launches, the deadly missile strikes Bismarck's port side on her stern. The violent explosion tears a huge hole in the hull. The shock was so strong that rivets flew off the bulkhead, and there was a sound like the ship was tearing apart. Bismarck's unarmored twin rudders, angled for the hard turn to avoid the torpedo, jammed 12 degrees to port. And Lieutenant Richter, die stiegen dann von unserem U-Raum. They sent two men down in diving suits to try to fix the rudder mechanism. But the water was rushing in too fast to the big hole, so we all had to come back up. The swordfish have crippled the mighty battleship. With rudders jammed, Bismarck can only steam back toward her enemy. We knew that all efforts failed to steer the ship. We were alone, surrounded by enemies. Admiral Gunter Luchen signals Berlin. Ship unmaneuverable. We will fight to the last shell. Long live the Führer. The British close in. hunt for the Bismarck steams toward a bloody climax. May 27, 1941. Battleship Bismarck, crippled by courageous swordfish pilots, steams helplessly toward the waiting guns of her enemies. Air power has demonstrated its supremacy over the mightiest warship. The British surface fleet closes in for the killing blow. Finally, there's an opportunity to avenge the hood and the British go into action confident that they can achieve this. On King George V, Fleet Admiral John Tubby plots his tactics. His plan? Force the cornered German ship to divide its fire against multiple targets. Then, turn his ship's broadside, unleashing massive firepower. Battleships Rodney and King George V speed to within 12 miles of Bismarck. At 8.47 a.m., Rodney's 16-inch guns fire. Then, King George V Shells rain down around Bismarck. The British crew stuff cotton in their ears to deaden the sound. Their throats sting as they breathe in the cordite fumes after each salvo. The desperate German battleship strikes back. Lutjen's first act was to open fire on the aged battleship Rodney. It's been suggested by some that, like Hood, he saw her as an older ship and thought, perhaps weaker, he could take her out and lessen the odds against him. Both sides miss their targets. With each salvo, the gunners adjust their rangefinders. With her rudders jammed, Bismarck can't maneuver. She's an easy target. Rodney scores the first hit on Bismarck at 9.02 a.m. 
the British have the range and let loose with everything they have. We were firing broadside. We were firing 10 shells at a time. 10 14 inch shells were going all over. And that's a hell of a lot of shells for one ship to take. Two British cruisers, Norfolk and Dorsetshire, join the fight. Bismarck is being pummeled from all sides. I can only from the endcamp tell that we are now up and to. Shell splinters rained through the air ducts that supplied our fresh air. The shells were hitting us fast, violently. Then, King George V's 14-inch guns make a critical hit. In that moment, ging eine Granate. A shell hit the gunnery control and also the main battery. The men screamed because of all the sulfur steam. It scalded them terribly. Bismarck is now a slaughterhouse. The huge dreadnought fires a final salvo. But at 9.31 AM, her mighty guns fall silent. As Bismarck's guns stopped, shells were hitting everywhere. Pieces of the ship were blasted away. In the end, it was pitiful to see, really, because we knew she wasn't firing anymore. Tubby's warships fire over 2,800 shells. 400 hits reduce Bismarck to a ravaged steel inferno. But the great battleship, her flag still flying, remains afloat. At 10.21, Tubby ceases fire. The cruiser Dorsetshire moves in to sink Bismarck with torpedoes. But the commanding officers left on Bismarck have other plans. To be in Räume. They announced over the PA that we should set scuttling charges and open the sea valves. We were going to sink her ourselves and abandon ship. Before the scuttling charges take effect, the Dorsetshire fires three 21-inch torpedoes into Bismarck. At 10.39 a.m., Bismarck sinks by the stern into a watery grave. During the fight, swordfish flew in but couldn't make attack runs in the fury of the surface battle. Now, Jock Moffat flies above the carnage. I was witness to a scene which haunted me for many days. All oh, those hundreds of poor sailors bobbing up and down in gale waters is not a pretty sight. And when we got back to the ship, there was no euphoria because we thought to ourselves, they're sailors, we're sailors, and they're by the grace of God. Out of Bismarck's crew of 2,092, only 115 survive. Among the dead are Admiral Luchens and Captain Lindemann. Bismarck's only combat mission lasted just 215 hours. She proved a formidable enemy against surface ships. But ultimately, courageous British pilots in antiquated biplanes proved that dreadnoughts were vulnerable to air power. It was the death knell of the battleship. Though U-boats would continue to attack convoys, Hitler never again allowed the German surface navy into the North Atlantic. The tragic fate of the giant Bismarck was proof that the sea was now controlled from the
the sky.